Hey everybody, we're going to get started on the next set of notes, um, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, it's a little bit wordy, um, if you guys remember, I kind of did a live version of this uh, this week and told you to make sure you go back and review this because I'm going to add some stuff to it. So um, it got, got a little wordier than I anticipated, but I think that was because when I transferred the, the slides over, I lost some of the slides or some of the information, so I wanted to make sure you got all the information you needed. So let's jump right into it and get going, okay? Um, there's your learning objectives. We kind of went over them. They'll also be on Canvas, so I encourage you to kind of look at those. Basically, this is going to be our learning objectives probably for the next several weeks because we're going to be talking about evidence collection. This is part one of, of multiple parts of the notes that we're going to be going through. Part two will be next week, and then I think we're going to even have a part three and four probably. Your assignment this week will be to write a short report about the proper collection procedures for at least one particular piece of item um, that was in our home invasion scene that we've been working on that you did the sketch for. So you're going to choose one of those uh, items, preferably an item that we kind of discussed in this set of notes, which would be some type of trace evidence, hair, fiber, etc. Okay, and then that'll be due on Friday. So let's go through this. What is the general order of collection? And I've mentioned this multiple times before. Um, keep in mind after you do your uh, forensic photography and you've sketched the scene, that's when you're going to start collecting materials. The first thing you're going to collect is the most transient evidence, the most fragile evidence, the trace materials, right? Especially from probable points of entry. Um, then you can collect low-level DNA, and we'll get into that in a later week. And then uh, other items that might contain biological evidence, blood, semen, it, th those type of things. And then finally move into fingerprints and then any other remaining items of value. And these are the larger items, the ones that aren't considered trace or aren't as fragile as trace or transient as trace, easily lost. So let's look, focus on trace evidence for this week. Trace evidence is evidence that exists in small quantities or size and may be difficult to see at the scene. This includes hair, fibers, paint chips, glass, building material, soil, any of those can be considered trace evidence. Um, a trace evidence uh, notes worksheet is also used to help keep, uh, keep trace evidence uh, recovery efforts organized and better documented. And we again have all those forms that we kind of made a standardized form for. Um, trace evidence is unlikely to be detected without a con concerted effort. So you got to really kind of look at this and really it comes down to kind of getting on your hands and knees and looking up close using magnifying glasses um, and ALS uh, sources, you know, alternative light sources to try to find this stuff. Um, so the general processing guidelines for this. Trace evidence is usually searched for and collected prior to the processing of any kind of fingerprints. We don't want to get fingerprint dust or use other techniques of, of finding latent prints and, and have that kind of affect our trace evidence. Um, trace evidence is easily overlooked. Its discovery requires a meticulous search, and we have to avoid cross-contamination of trace material by thoroughly cleaning collection gear between samples and changing gloves. Magnification may be important. The use of magnifying glass can actually greatly assist the search of trace materials. These are really small, tiny, tiny things. It could be a single hair or a single fiber. Um, somewhere in an inconspicuous location that we're looking for. Uh, magnifiers come in various forms, including the old-fashioned, you know, handheld kind, right? And then you have headband band devices that kind of are like almost like wearing a, a magnifying glass in front of your eyes and it leaves your hands free so you can do some of the search. Another technique that's typically used is oblique lighting. This is just a normal everyday flashlight um, or other lighting device, and we hold it at a a very low angle, oblique angle to the source that we're searching. So when we do this, it kind of helps us view some of these things um, with shadows being cast that help us kind of see that there's something there. And you can see in this picture, uh, for example, it makes, it makes some of these shadows just along some of these ridges and stuff a little bit more obvious and we can see that there's something there might not see that unless we use that oblique lighting. Um, and then move the light from various directions will also help us to assist in the visualization and, and uh, trace evidence and seeing those things a little bit better. 
We can also use ultraviolet lighting. Some trace materials will fluoresce under UV light between 100 and 400 nanometers. Using UV light after the white light may allow investigators to see materials that weren't observable under just the normal everyday flashlight. Um, UV light should be held at various angles to the surface, but not obliquely. Usually you're kind of shining it in different angles um, around where you're looking. And then we also have ALSs. These are those, uh, a lot of times they're the blue lights that we see. Now notice, uh, I don't think it shows it here, but notice this lady um, is actually wearing a special pair of glasses here, and these are filters. So you company the various wavelengths, and they're usually somewhere between 400 and 900, oh, I'm sorry, 400 and 800 nanometers, um, but we, we couple that with various uh, filters that we use for glasses. Usually you have orange and you have clear and you have, you know, blue filters and different, different filters that you can wear on your eyes and it kind of changes um, the uh, way you can see certain things, certain items of trace evidence. And it's not just for trace evidence, but we're talking about trace evidence here. So. The ALS offers a larger range of wavelength options and it should be used um, similar to the way the UV light is used. There's no specific guidelines require, requiring what wavelengths to utilize um, and a broad range of wavelengths should be considered. So you can try various ones. All right, so moving on. After you've detected the trace evidence, when we're getting ready to collect, the general procedures are you're going to photograph the trace evidence with uh, evidence establishing photograph. In other, in other words, it kind of places context, these mid-range photographs. And we'll get more into photography later. Usually we've covered it already, but I'm trying to push it back so we can do a little bit more hands-on stuff with that. Um, or we can, and then we have to photograph the trace evidence so that it fills the entire camera. And we might require close-up rings or macro photography lenses and stuff like that to do that. Uh, trace evidence at the scene then can be seized with the item on which it was deposited as long as it will not be dislodged. Uh, and then if there's any possibility that trace material may be dislodged, then you have to collect it immediately and package it separately. When collecting trace materials, all, always follow the rule, bring the container to the evidence. In other words, don't pick up that little hair and then try to walk over and find you know, a package to put it in because if you drop that hair on the way, chances are you might not find it again. So you bring the package to the hair so that you know you're you're holding that hair in the tweezers um, for as little time as possible to get it into the package. Um, Post-it notes may be quickly used to collect perishable trace hairs and fibers. Um, mark the post-it note with the collection information and then use the adhesive strip to actually collect the evidence. Um, they may not be, you know, they can then be folded over to protect the trace evidence and placed into an envelope or other suit, suitable uh, container. Uh, trace evidence may also be collected with a rubber tipped or disposable plastic forceps. You can also use your fingers for some of those as long as your hands are gloved. Um, trace evidence may be tape lifted from surfaces. Uh, check with your jur jurisdiction for that. Um, once collected, the tape is placed against a clear plastic surface such as a clean document protector. Uh, and evidence vacuum can sometimes be used, but that's usually a last resort and that happens a lot of times in the lab. All right. So how do we package trace evidence? Trace evidence must be double packaged. The primary inner package should coincide with the most effective packaging for the particular lifting method. And then we double package trace evidence because we don't want to put something very small or tiny into a larger envelope. So a lot of times a druggist fold um, or sometimes it's called a chemist fold or a bindle um, can be used to kind of place the trace material in that and then a standard envelope will work effectively for the outer packaging and that usually has your chain of custody on it. Uh, avoid plastic bags. Um, static electricity often builds up on their surfaces. It makes them inadvisable for primary packaging. Uh, paint chips should be packaged so that uh, the edges are protected from fracture. We don't want to mess up the fracture or, or crack the edges because sometimes that paint chip will be like a puzzle piece and it'll fit into a particular location that can be important. Um, and then whenever trace evidence is seized from an item, control samples of that material should also be taken um, from potential donor sources. So, And we'll talk a little bit about some of those controlled samples as we go through some of these particular pieces of evidence. So let's, let's do hair first, okay? So hair must be evaluated to determine. It can be determined if it's an animal or a human or what region of the body it came from, head, pubic, etc. 
how it was removed, whether cut, pulled, shed, um, if there's any been any dyes or treatments. Um, sometimes you get the follicular tag, and that can be important for DNA. So both DNA and mitochondrial DNA testing might be possible to determine the source of the hair. Unique dyes and treatments can also help uh, with uh, the donor source. Um, hairs often can be tested for drug toxicology for longer term heavy metal poisoning. And then we need to get control samples from possible contributors and that should be, and this varies uh, anywhere from 50 to 100, sometimes 20s, you know, a, a suitable amount. Um, it just depends on your, the jurisdiction. There's no real hard and fast rule for that. A lot of times if this is especially, um, if it's a rape victim and it has to be pubic hairs or something like that, usually you're going to have uh, medical personnel that's going to be responsible for doing that. Recovery of evidence samples. So recover all hair present. If possible, use the fingertips um, as long as your hand's gloved or tweezers to pick up the hair, place it in bindles or coin envelopes, which should then be folded and sealed into larger envelopes. If hair is attached to something such as uh, in dry blood or caught in a metal or crack of a glass, don't attempt to remove it, but try to leave the hair intact on the object and collect the entire object. If it's too large, then just you're going to have to wrap up the hair and collect the object uh, separate if you can't put the whole thing into a package. Um, if it's impossible to collect that object, let's say it's a permanent piece of furniture, a countertop or something like that, then you're going to have to carefully remove the hair. All right, so let's move on to fibers. Fibers can be evaluated for determination of general category of fiber, whether it's animal, wool, mink, fox, vegetable, cotton, linen, uh, mineral, it could be fiberglass insulation or synthetic blends, you know, nylon, rayon, something like that. The treatments and unique origin of the fibers may allow determining the source of poten or potential sources of the fiber. Um, we should take control samples from carpeting, ropes, etc., which may have come into contact with the victim or suspect. Uh, such evidence is often found in fabric abrasions or caught on materials or, you know, if somebody's climbing through a, a glass window to get torn on screens or broken glass. Um, fibers can normally be uh, conducted to determine the type of color of fiber. These examinations sometimes indicate the type of garment that fabric may have come from. Sometimes if it's a perfect tear, it might even, again, kind of like that puzzle piece mentality, fit um, a suspect shirt or something like that. If the threads or fiber are, are found and they can be picked up, then you can use either forceps or fingertips as long as your hands glove, place them, and you place them into a bindle. Mm -hmm. And then obviously a larger envelope, kind of this very, very similar to how you would collect a uh, um, hair. Okay? If the fibers are short and few in number and it's possible to do so, you can wrap the entire item and send it in and they can remove the fibers um, in the laboratory. Um, pick up fibers uh, on tape if the laboratory in your jurisdiction allows it. You can remove uh, fibers that way. Um, always send all clothing of a person from which you may have originated to the laboratory for comparison purposes. And then make sure anytime you're wrapping these um, articles of clothing that you keep them separate. You know, don't, don't wrap them together. Don't put the suspect shirt and pants and socks all in the same package. You would wrap each one separately. All right, let's do some paint chips. This is one of the ones that we didn't really cover too much in, uh, in class, so I'm going to kind of go over this a little bit slower. Uh, chips transfer frequently. Um, this occurs when two objects come into contact with each other and where one or both have paint, painted surfaces. Uh, fracture matches of dried paint can be allowed to you know, match up specific paint chips, for example. Um, sometimes the layers which build up if a surface has been painted four or five times, those layers can be very uh, unique and can help determine origin as well. Uh, paint evidence may be uh, present in the breaking and entering cases or when a tool is used, to, like when a tool is used to pry open a door or a window. Um, and remember, paint uh, from the scene may also be found on tools recovered from the suspect. So you could have a transfer from the house to the tool or from the tool to the house um, in these B&E cases. So this is kind of what I was talking about. If you have multiple layers, you can see this is a sample and you can have one, two, three, four, five, six layers. Um, that would be very unique. If we have this from a suspect and then we take a sample from the wall at uh, uh, the store that was broken into 
and those layers, especially the thickness of those layers on a comparison microscope match up, that's a pretty um, significant piece of evidence that can be used. When we're collecting these, we collect the paint chips, we can collect um, basically small objects containing paint transfers. We can also cut out sections of larger objects containing transfers. So all of those methods can be used in collection. You also want to take control samples for paint chips, take a control sample from an unmarked surface near the damaged area, and then take a control sample all the way down to the unpainted surface. So you want to make sure that when you're cutting a control sample that you actually go all the way down to um, whatever the surface, raw surface was, whether it's wood or plaster or whatever. And then you have known samples. Known samples, these are collected any item of paint from a suspect or source of transfer uh, from vehicles. Uh, you can take paint samples from several places around the damage area. It's also important to take the full thickness of the paint all the way down to the metal or body of the car if this is on a vehicle. When we package paint, double package paint chips in a pill box or druggist fold, then place them into a plastic bag or sealable box. Do not allow objects containing paint smears to contact other evidence. You don't want the, the, there to be any kind of cross transfer. And then seal known paint samples in several containers. All right, now we'll move into glass a little bit. We talked a little bit about this, but I added a couple things here as well. Uh, glass is frequently broken or shattered during the commission of crimes. Glass can be evaluated for general characteristics of the sample and compared with known sources of glass at the scene. Close examination of edges of broken window pane may indicate whether the glass was broken from the inside or the outside, and that's kind of that part that I'm going to add to it. We'll talk about that. Um, stage break-ins uh, sometimes will be identified through the direction of force evaluation, and we'll, we'll show you how that's done. The last evidence at the scene can provide uh, information such as fracture matching, latent prints could be on there, direction of force, sequence of impacts. We'll look at that as well. We talked about that in class velocity of impacts and angle of impacts. Uh, when glass is broken, microscopic fragments travel backwards towards the direction of force. These fragments can be found in the hair or clothing of suspects. So if glass fragments are potentially present on clothing, um, seize the clothing of the suspect, package it securely, and then also make sure the suspect kind of combs their hair over a clean sheet of paper and collect any fragments that may um, be gathered that way. So. Just some terminology real quick, because this really wasn't in there. There's, there's two types of fractures. There's, there's uh, radial fractures and there's concentric fractures. And don't get them mixed up. Radial sounds like it might be the round ones, but it's not. Radial fractures are these long ones that kind of come out. And when you're looking at um, fractured glass, a lot of times it kind of looks like a spider web maybe. And you have these long ones that kind of come out. Those are radial fractures. And then you have these circular ones that kind of go around. Those are called concentric fractures. Okay, So the primary radial fracture, long, not circular fractures, on a window pane may be used to determine which side of the glass received the force when it was broken. Um, this can be important when it's believed the scene might be staged. So if we take a look at this glass, both within the frame, the stuff that's still in the frame, and loose in the scene, right, displaced, fallen on the floor or something, may be examined. The edge of the primary radial fracture is examined for the presence of a wave-like pattern created by small concordia fractures. Um, these waves will run parallel to the surface of the glass and then at one point turn towards the front or back surface at about 90 degrees. And I'm going to show you a picture of this so it'll be a little bit clearer. This evaluation is only valid on primary radial fractures, fractures that originate at the point of impact. Um, fragments may be present in in secondary fractures, but these are not functional for directional force. So let's look at what they're talking about here. The rule to follow is four R's, and this helps you remember it, okay? Ripples on radial fractures are at right angles to the rear or direction away from the force. So if you take a look, this is showing uh, uh, the force is moving this way. So it's, on, it's at right angles. These are those ripples that we're talking about, okay? these lines that you'll see on the edge. And this is an actual piece of glass. You can see these lines kind of coming around and then they, they kind of go at a right angle here. So they're at these right angles here, right? These right angles on one side and that's the side away from the force. So the force being applied is gonna be at the opposite side of the right angle. So on this piece of glass, the right angle appears to be here, right? 
Okay, that's where this comes together. So the force was coming from this side. And this piece of glass here looks very similar to this bottom half down here, right? Kind of moves into the glass this way, but then on the opposite side of the force, it becomes like a right angle there. Um, compare residues on in-place fragments. Uh, you can sometimes determine which was the inside and which was the outside. So when you're looking at these displaced ones, if there's like a thin layer of dust, because we live in the desert here, on the outside, then you can tell which one is the outside or the inside, um, or oil or any other markings that might give you that idea. And then we talked about the order of impact. I think we use this one down here. Uh, determining the order of fractures is part of crime scene reconstruction. Basically, late fractures will not cross earlier fractures. So if you're taking a look at these three over here, and this is a drawing, right? Um, you have A, B, and C. We can look at this and we can see, okay, this fracture doesn't cross here. This fracture doesn't cross here. This fracture does cross here, but this one doesn't. So we can kind of put these in order. We can say, okay, B must have happened first, right? Because C doesn't cross it, A doesn't cross it. Then A occurred, and then C occurred. So you can kind of put these in order pretty easily. And the same thing was true over here. This was the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. These kind of went in order from left to right. All right, so how do we collect this? First, you photograph and document the location of the glass and the glass fragments um, on the crime scene sketch. Uh, collect the clothing of suspects and all glass present at the scene, if you have suspects there, right? including any glass in the window or door frame. Mark pieces removed from the frame to indicate which side uh, faced inside. And then make sure you collect some known samples. Collect a known sample of glass when needed for comparison with glass fragments recovered from a suspect. Wrap large pieces separately in cotton, clean paper bag or butcher paper type paper. Small fragments can be packaged together in small container, such as a druggist fold. Prevent shifting during transit as much as possible. Make sure you mark fragile or sharp hazard on there. And then control samples from broken glass should include glass from the window pane, the glass should be marked as to its orientation in the window, inside, outside, upside down, etc. Place large glass fragments in boxes. Sometimes boxes aren't even big enough, so you might put them between two flat pieces of cardboard and kind of tape them in there that way. Any hit and run glass, you recover all glass and keep in mind some of it might be pretty far from where the main um, hit and run kind of took place because obviously the person's running or fleeing the scene, they could drive quite a distance away and you might find glass along the way. Um, standards for comparisons, windows, if broken window is small, send the whole window in. Um, otherwise, you might have to take certain pieces out and, and send them in. Auto glass, same, same is true. Auto headlights, make sure you collect it all. Other glass, when bottles or glass objects are broken, recover all remaining glass. So you want to take as much as you can, obviously, and you know, for small windows, you can send the entire window in. A lot of times you can put these together in a puzzle piece kind of way, and if you find a fragment on a suspect, that could be um, a pretty, pretty good piece or important piece of evidence. All right, building materials. I didn't really touch on this, but we talked about it since, uh, since your staged um, crime scene in your house, right? This home invasion was basically forced entry in the front door. You might have wood chips or something like that um, from, from where the door was pried open. So. When doing this, I'll keep this one pretty short. Collect sus uh, the suspect's clothing. Collect hair combings from the suspect that could have wood chips or sawdust or anything, metal filings, etc. in it. And then the known sample, collect uh, a control sample from each layer. Uh, the suspect would have had to pass through to gain entry. So um, keep in mind if they're sawing through bars or if they're um, prying open a wood, um, make sure you kind of collect enough material for that. Um, also soil. Soil samples may be critical in linking a suspect to a victim scene um, or conveyance, such as an automobile. In some cases, it's helpful to determine if the soil on the clothes, tools, or automobiles could have came from a particular location. Um, send a sketch to the lab with your evidence showing where each sample was collected. So when you're collecting samples from outside a window, maybe where somebody crawled in, then you're going you're gonna to kind of show where the samples were taken from in your crime scene sketch as well. Collect uh, any small items on which soil is found, sh uh, shoes, tools, tires, floor mats, etc. Uh, scrape soil from larger items into containers using a clean instrument, such as a razor. Um, uh, on large objects, if 
Only trace amounts are available. Collect the samples with adhesive tape. Samples should be taken from the area of interest as well, 3 and 15 feet from the area of interest, and then repeat along the north, south, east, and west coordinates. Okay? Um, collect only from the depth that the activity occurred such as a surface location, so down to maybe about one inch, um, or at various steps if the evidence is buried. So if you're doing a clandestine burial recovery, then you can take them at various depths as well. Uh, samples should be placed in uh, individual canisters, jars, or plastic urine cups. You're going to need known samples. Take at least eight oil samples from an area where you want to compare the question soil. These would be taken from 3 and 15 feet of interest along, again, north, south, east, and west coordinates. Collect only at the depth that the suspect sample was found. Samples should be placed individually in canisters, jars, and plastic urine cups. And then you can also collect alibi samples. Sometimes the suspect will say, well, I wasn't there. I was camping out in the woods at this location. So if that's the case, then you would go out to that location. You collect sam soil samples from there, too, and make sure they don't match the suspect's shoes if, if that's where we found soil. When packaging, dry all soil samples before final packaging. Wrap small items separately to prevent losing any soil. Um, pack scra uh, scraped samples from larger items into film canisters, baby food jars, plastic urine cups. Um, clean baby food jars. Oh, don't do them with the baby food stuff in it. We usually have these plastic receptacles that we use for soil. And then pack known and questioned samples in separate shipping containers. And that's it. That kind of takes us through uh, the trace evidence stuff. Uh, next week, we're going to be focusing more on fingerprinting and, and viewing fingerprints. And I'm, I think I'm going to do a demo um, this week as well on how to um, view a latent fingerprint just using typical fingerprint dust um, before we get into the notes. So that's all we got for you this week. Have a great day and let me know if you need help, any help on anything and I will talk to you later. <laughs>